Uh, hello, Year Nine. This is uh, Chapter Four of The Falconer's Knot, and you should all have read Chapter Three. And so, a quick recap. Um, the father of Silvano, the Baron, um, talked to Gervasio and wanted to know about Gervasio and the woman he was in love with, and Gervasio was lying. So that doesn't bode well for Gervasio as an honest person and thinking about your predictions. Lots of you think that as well. Um, and then we have Brother Anselmo traveling to place orders for the paints, the colors that he's using in his frescoes. And Chiara is still thinking about Silvano when she met him. And now we're on to chapter four, St. Martin's Cloak. So the morning air felt fresher to Silvano than a draught of pure spring water. It was a clear sunny day with a sharp tang of cold because of the early hour and he hoped as he rode his grey stallion flat out. And he laughed as he rode his grey stallion flat out. The horse shook his head and snorted as he galloped, as happy to be away from the friary as his master was. We are free, Moonbeam, at last, free at last, cried Silvano his novice's tunic streaming out behind him and revealing some very unreligious brown knees. Even Celeste, gripping the pommel of the saddle with her yellow talons, seemed to enjoy the feeling of the wind ruffling her feathers. After a while, the road began to climb into the hills and Silvano slackened the horse's pace. He found an open spot near a small stream and took the hood off his falcon. Fly, Celeste, he whispered releasing her jesses and casting her off into the sky. She soared heavenward on a current of warm air and was soon lost to sight. Silvano wished for the hundredth time that he had been allowed to bring a Tora with him. The hound would have flushed out a good eating bird for Celeste in no time. As it was, he had to hope the falcon would return to his sight before she found prey on her own. He listened for the silvery sound of the two bells on her legs and was soon rewarded. Celeste had flown in a wide circle and Savano could see, just see her hovering high above. And even as he searched in vain for another bird in flight, his falcon, with her keen eyesight, went into a stoop. She had spotted something below her. Savano ran in the direction of Celeste's rapid descent crushing grasses and twigs beneath his clumsy friar's sandals. He found Celeste sitting on a plump partridge and let her take a bit of the warm flesh before skillfully making the substitution with a bit of chicken wing he had brought in his pouch. He stuffed the still bleeding bird into his saddlebag and let Celeste take a break. The day was warming up and he raised a heartfelt prayer of thanks to God above for letting him be out here in the Umbrian sunshine, instead of inside the dark chapel of the friary, in the company of several dozen pious men, all older than him. Mona Isabella ran her house household as well as any woman in Gubbio. Once she had accepted that she could not escape her marriage, she had become like a trained hawk. She would obediently return to her master's fist with something good for him to eat, which is to say she kept a good table. Ubaldo's money meant that she could order the finest food and the richest clothes. She and her children went about in velvet, silk and lace, like nobles, and their dinners 
were as lavish as a bishop's. And this was because Isabella supervised everything herself. No selection of food from the market or cloth from the merchant was made without her eye upon it. Not a chicken could be plucked in her kitchen without her knowing where every feather ended up according to her servants. It was a way to fill her days, but that didn't mean she was happy. Thousands of women before her, she supposed, had endured marriages to men they didn't love, or even disliked. But every now and again, a rage would raise in her heart that took her by surprise. It made her rail against her fate so hard that she had to hide away in her private sitting room till the fit passed. On these days, she thought of the young scholar with the brown eyes more than usual. It was a private dream of hers to imagine what marriage to Domenico might have been like. It was a dis disastrous fantasy because of the descent into reality that had to follow, but for a few hours she could picture the two of them sitting side by side, poring over an illuminated book while Domenico talked to her of poetry. She remembered the terrible day when they met for the last time and she told him that she must marry Ubaldo. Domenico had told her the story of the Umbrian poet Jacopone de Todi to console them both. Imagine, my darling, he said, Jacopone, the wealthy young man, had married the lady of his heart's desire, the woman he had loved for years. They pledged themselves to each other for all time, but not long afterwards, at a grand feast, the platform where his bride was standing collapsed and she was crushed to death. How dreadful, said Isabella. Domenico took both her hands in his. When the body of his wife was unearthed from the rubble, Jacopone found that she was wearing an instrument of penance under her beautiful dress. Even on that day of rejoicing, she had clothed herself in such a way as to mortify her flesh, in memory of our Lord's suffering, and because she feared Jacopone was too attached to the pleasures of the world. So um, mortifying flesh and instruments of penance. Um, I don't know if you've heard of flagellating, where people used to walk around whipping themselves in penance. Um, so people also, also used to wear hair shirts. So under their normal clothes, they'd wear really coarse, rough, itchy, scratchy material that would um, obviously be really uncomfortable to wear. So people would do that in purpose, on purpose to link to the suffering that Jesus had on the cross. Um, uh, it didn't have to be hair shirts though, there could have been like um, bits of metal attached to a stick in to some people's backs and things like that. Um, so you always be in pain. Um, lots of us in our modern times would think that's very strange. So Isabella had been confused. What woman could be so pious and yet love a mortal man carnally enough to marry him? What did Jacopone do? She asked. For ten years he wandered like a beggar, sleeping rough, said Domenico. And then he decided to vote, devote the rest of his life to God. He turned his back on this world of personal desires and possessions and dedicated himself to the service of our Lord. He joined the Francescans. If he wrote the poetry before to his beloved be beloved's beauty, since her death he writes only in praise of God. And this is a tale to cheer me asked Isabella, her throat aching from all the tears she had shed. It is to show you that life must continue, even after great grief, said Domenico. Yours and mine. You shall be another's, but I shall never marry. I shall carry your image in my heart forever, and it will comfort me whenever my life is hard. And that was how they parted, with a kiss that had to last them for the rest of their lives. They had not seen each other since. Domenico's lips had remained unkissed ever after. If he had been true to his vow and Isabella's had suffered the unloving touch of Ubaldo's. 
When her first son had been born, she had wanted to call him Domenico, but her husband wouldn't hear of it. He is my son, not the bastard of your miserable swain, he had said. Let him be Federico, after my father. Federico was almost was followed swiftly by Giovanni, and then there was a lost child. Ubaldo had been almost tender towards her then in her new grief. Was it because of that, or the indifference he later felt for her, that she was allowed to call her third boy Domenico after all? Isabella neither knew nor cared. It was enough that she could say the name, caressingly to her little boy. In spite of all her care not to show it, he was her favourite child. Her little daughter, Francesca, was a great joy, and she loved all her sons, but Domenico had a special place in her heart. He looked least like Ubaldo of all their children, having her rosy complexion and chestnut hair, while the others were all dark, and he was his father's least favoured child, which endeared him all the more to his mother. It was almost as if this little Domenico had been the result of her unfaithfulness. Though this was entirely imaginary, she was not a fond wife, but she was an honourable one. Whenever she retired to her sitting room in one of her black moods, it was of little Domenico that she thought, pretending that he was the son of her dream husband with the same name. It was on one of those days that she had an imperious knock at the door and started to her feet in surprise. Ubaldo never visited her here, and yet there was no mistaking the master's knock. He did not wait for Isabella to open the door, but came in, a dark presence, shadowing the pretty space she had created for herself. There was no painting or relic of her first love, and yet she was conscious that the room was a kind of shrine. Ubaldo seemed to sense it too, curling his lip with disdain, but he made no reference to her setting. I have to go on a journey, he said, to the friars in Assisi. The Franciscans will place an order for even richer altar cloths now that the basilica is near completion. They want the best silks and I must have them embroidered according to their designs. I shall be away three days. Thank you for telling me, said Isabella politely, but exulting that she would have three whole days without her husband. When do you leave? Tonight, said Ubaldo. I shall ride as far as the friary at Giardinetto and lodge there. Chiara was walking to the refectory when she sensed the aroma of roasting partridge on the air. It made her mouth water. But the smell of cooking was not coming from the little wood oven at the convent. Meat was even more of a rarity for the Grey Sisters than for their brothers next door. But that was where the partridges were being roasted, turned on a spit over an outdoor fire by the false novice. Kiora felt her stomach growl. She cast down her eyes as she went on towards the refectory, but not before she had seen the boy smile at her. He seemed happy, she thought, and she was sure that he hadn't been when he came. The first night when she had seen him riding on, in on his grey horse, perhaps she would have had caught to smile too if there was roast fowl to dine on in the convent. There was nothing to look forward to but a sort of savoury gruel, lumpy and rather gritty. Chiara found herself sitting at the refectory table opposite Sister Veronica. The sisters ate in silence, but the colour mistress cast a sympathetic glance at the young novice toying with the gluey mess in her wooden spoon. As soon as they were both outside again, and walking back to the dormitory for quiet contemplation, Sister Veronica spoke to Chiara. Would you like to come with me when I take Sir Simone's colours to Assisi? Chiara looked at her in surprise. You may leave the convent, Sister, she asked. I thought all the professed sisters had to remain enclosed. I have a special dispensation from the abbess, said Sister Veronica. I may go outside the convent in the service of the Lord. So would you like to come with me? Chiara nodded gratefully. Just to have a change of scene from the convent would be a treat. Yes, please, sister, she said. I should like that very much. The wooden cart was laden with boxes and barrels filled with glass jars. 
it didn't really take two friars to transport them from Giardinetto to Assisi, but the abbot was quite content to let Silvana go with brother Anselmo, and his strong young arms would be useful for the unloading. It was not a long road, but Silvano had not travelled it before. In fact, he had never visited Assisi in all his 16 years, although it was not far from Perugia. Brother Anselmo was telling him about the basilica as he occasionally flipped the reins on the back of the horses. The lower church, where Ser Simone is working, was built first. In fact, they started building it within two years of St Francis's death. But the whole basilica was only finished less than 40 years ago. Finished, said Silvano, surprised. How can it be finished? The painters are still working there. I suppose in one sense, a great church is never completed, said Anselmo. It is always being added to and beautified. But the basilica was consecrated before I was born. And the frescoes of the upper church are already a sight that pilgrims come from miles to see. You've seen them yourself? Oh yes, many times. They were painted by Giotto de Bondone. Sir Simone speaks of him with almost the same reverence we use towards St Francis. Forgive me, said Silvano, but I am rather ignorant about saints in their lives. That's understandable, said Anselmo. You didn't expect to be joining a religious house. Silvano looked at his bony profile. You know about me, he asked quietly. Father Bonsignor told me a little when he asked me to take you on in the colour room. I know you are not really a novice. And you know what I'm supposed to have done? And Selma nodded. Well, I didn't, said Silvano. And Selma smiled. Of course not, he said. You are no murderer. Silvano felt his heart lift. No one had said that to him since he found Tommaso dying in the street. Even his father had needed to ask him. He felt a warm rush of affection for Brother Anselmo, who accepted him so calmly and believed in him so completely. Who else knows why I'm in Giardinetto? he asked. Only Brother Ranieri, said Anselmo. I know about him, said Silvano. As novice master, he needed to know that I was seeking sanctuary and had no calling. Then there is just him, myself and the abbot, said Anselmo. I wonder how long I'll have to stay here, said Silvano. Do you hate it so much? asked Anselmo. Oh no, said Silvano, flustered and wondering if he had seemed rude or ungrateful. Not at all. It's just that I can't bear not knowing what's going on in Perugia. Have they found the real murderer, or is my name still slandered? It seems cowardly to hide away in the friary when I am not guilty. I would have stayed to plead my innocence, but my father wouldn't let me take the risk. I am his only son. You are precious to him, said Anselmo simply. I can understand that. I wasn't born a friar, you know. Silvano wondered if the colour master was one of those religious who had been a married man and lost his wife. Perhaps he had even had children of his own. You'd be a good father, brother, he said impulsively, making them both laugh. The hill of Assisi was coming into view with its fortification at the top. Silvano could see the basilica even from this distance, looking as if it had grown out of the rocks at the side of the hill, rather than being built by the hands of the men. As they got nearer, Silvano could see that large numbers of people were swarming around the great church. There were pilgrims, barefoot and white-hatted, leaning on staffs, and there were people selling food and wine, and others selling carved wooden crosses and likenesses of St Francis and St Clare. Then there were artisans who Silvano guessed were working for the artists, stirring barrels of plaster. He felt very proud to be bringing the colours that would bring the plaster to life. Brother Anselmo left Silvano in charge of the horses while he went to find Simone and Martini. He soon returned with the artist, who was clearly delighted to see both of them. Welcome to Assisi, Brother Silvano, he said. I hear you have not visited here before. You must let me show you my work. But let's get these pigments unloaded first. He beckoned to one of the young workmen making gesso. Marco, come here and give our young friend a hand. He brings colours from Giardinetto. The four men made short work of unpacking the cart. And then Marco took the horses off to a nearby stable. Silvano stretched in a rather unfriar-like way. He had been carrying in barrels without taking much notice of 
of his surroundings and his arms ached. But now he turned and looked around him. Simona was ordering the new materials on a long bench. They were in a chapel off the nave of the lower church. The windows had no glass in them and the light streamed in. That and the wooden scaffolding obscuring part of the walls made it difficult to see the wall paintings at first. Silvano looked closer and he could see that each one was a miracle of colour and storytelling. The ceiling and the higher parts were completed and the round wooden platforms where Simone stood to work was only just above Silvano's head. Simone saw him looking at the pictures and invited him up to the platform to show him more closely. You see, Brother Silvano, there is Saint Martin cutting his cloak in half for the beggar. There on the left was the saint on horseback taking his sword to his cloak. Saint Martin was turned around, looking backwards over his right shoulder at a poor shivering man, just as his horse had his neck turned around too. The saint's horse reminded Silvana of Moonbeam. It too was a grey horse with a proud neck and flared nostrils. The cloak concealed its hindquarters, but Silvano was sure it was a hunting stallion too. It made a contrast with the saint, whose mild face was framed by curled golden hair and a decorated halo. The whole picture was a mass of pinks and greens and golds, offset by the dark sky, blue sky behind. Silvano's gaze travelled upwards and he gasped. Peeping out from behind the scaffolding was Sir Simone's own face, with what Silvano thought of, uh, of as his sucking lemons expression. He was wearing a fashionable green and blue baritone on his head, quite different from the working clothes the painter was in now. Simone caught his eye and laughed. You must read the pictures in sequence, he said, not up from that one, but along to your right. You are not to look at my ugly face yet. He indicated a picture of the saint lying in a bed having a dream. It was startlingly realistic and Silvano, who knew nothing about painting, could not believe that he was seeing a flat wall. There was the saint in a nightcap lying in his bed, his body making the chequered bedspread rise and fall around its contours. He had elegant and expensive embroidered white pillows and sheets and a gold halo surrounded his nightcap. St Martin's eyes were closed, but there in his room was Christ the Lord, surrounded by angels and wearing the very half of the blue cloak that Martin had given to the beggar in the other picture. Silvano was entranced. So the beggar was really Jesus, he said to the painter, and St Martin had a dream of him. Simone looked pleased. You didn't know that story before. That's good. It means I've told it properly. I've heard it, but I couldn't remember all of it, admitted Silvano. But it's very clear. Martin was kind to a poor man, and then it turned out to be the Lord. It is as we read in the Evangelist, said Brother Anselmo, smiling. Our Lord said, whenever you have done something for one of my least important brothers, you've done it for me. So St. Matthew tells us. Silvano suddenly felt safe between these two men, as safe as he felt in the friary. They were wise and good, and he could tell him, and could tell him of wonders. It was a world far away from blood and murder. A shrill voice interrupted his thoughts. So Simone, we're here with the colours. He turned and saw a grey-clad nun. By her side was another, and he suddenly found himself staring straight into the eyes of the pretty novice from the convent next door. So that was chapter four. So I'd like you to read chapter five as your task this week. So a stab in the dark. So we just learned about St. Francis's cloak and the story there. And I would like you to read chapter five, A Stab in the Dark. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy reading it this week.